Hi everyone, this is John Kyo, the chairman of the Trace Alliance program, and uh, I was asked by the team to give an expert view on the GS1 system. Now, this is not a formal presentation on behalf of GS1 organization, so I do thank uh, my colleagues, uh, my former colleagues at GS1 for giving me some slides to, uh, to present. Um, I used to be a senior vice president at GS1 Canada and also a director of product and consumer safety and anti-counterfeit at the global office. So I think I'm well positioned to be able to give an overview. But as I mentioned, uh, if you want to get more information on the GS1 system, please go online or you can go to uh, YouTube. There's some fantastic videos and animation of the GS1 system in action or go to your local GS1 organization. GS1 is a global not-for-profit uh, standards body and they're active in more than 110 or 112 countries. So they have physical offices in those countries and, uh, and they do a significant amount of work on behalf of business. So they are a not-for-profit and uh, believe me, I had never worked as hard as when I was at uh, GS1. It's a really hardworking organization and they do tremendous work on behalf of their members. Now the GS1 organization is around for more than 40 years. I believe it was April the 3rd, 1973, when uh, US industry decided on the current uh, linear barcode that you have on most products. And strangely enough, it was also, I believe, on April the 3rd, 1973, when the first cell phone call was made. So now you have these two ubiquitous uh, systems that are global and, uh, and standardized. You have them all over the world, but they've started to come together over the last five or six years. And when the GS1 system comes together with mobile computing, uh, the cell phone, you have the, a fantastic opportunity to be able to deliver uh, transparent information to consumers. So keep that in the back of your mind as well. So now if we jump on to the, the GS1 uh, organization itself, it's got a management board worldwide. And look at the organizations that are in here. And this is why it's so important to, to know about GS1 and know about the standards and how it works. I mean, in here they have Amazon. Uh, Procter & Gamble, Alibaba, Google, Walmart, and go down the list here to some of the massive uh, companies around the world. So these are the guys that guide GS1 as an organization worldwide. Now, if I pick, let's say, GS1 Canada or GS1 US, uh, in both countries, the mandate will be slightly different. It really depends on the maturity in that country. So the GS1 mandates can vary slightly by country but they have core services that they have to deliver on behalf of industry. So think of GS1 in each country as an independent, neutral uh, standards body. And it's maybe, maybe it's a little bit like a, a McDonald's franchise. There's some certain things that they have to do on behalf of the global office, which is in Brussels. And then there's some things on top of that that they do, which is very specific to their country uh, based on the maturity level of the industry in that country. So again, GS1 Germany may be slightly different to GS1 France and so on and so forth. And, and also in some countries like India, you may have very what we call very, very low percentage of organized trade where you actually have a, a retail shop and cash registers that uh, customers go through. So in, uh, I remember a number of years ago, India was less than 10% of organized trade. So a lot of the trade was actually unorganized uh, in markets and so on. It's very hard to manage that. And GS1 does not operate in that market, but they are, operate in the organized trade uh, area. Uh, and, and India now has, of course, matured much further than that. So let's uh, let's move on here. And let, let me make a little bit of humor here before I start. And let me just ask you this question. Did you hear about the major recall for iPads last night? Well, of course, nobody heard about it because it's all fake and false. And I'm just making this a uh, little bit of humor here to give an example that when we describe something to each other, especially in, in, in a world where we have hundreds and hundreds of, of languages, we can make mistakes and we can say that an iPad or overhear someone saying that iPads are dangerous or iPads are doing this and so on and so forth. So the, the GS1 system helps to clarify that. And if you, if you look at what happens when we don't have standards, I mean, th these are the obvious ones here. Although I said GS1 is around for more than 40 years, it was really focused on driving efficiencies in the retail operations. But the classic uh, cases here of the plugs, and when we all go on travel, we know it's just a nightmare to try to uh, 
to to remember which which plugs to uh, to bring with us and which adapters to bring with us and 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 when you're when you're buying clothes I mean I'm from uh, I'm from Canada uh, born in Ireland but you know a little bit bigger and I live in Vietnam so when I go to buy some clothes here in Vietnam I have to remember that the the L size is not the L for Canadians or, or Europeans. I have to go up to uh, XL. So there's little things that you have to remember. Of course, shoe sizes will vary uh, as well between Europe and uh, and the US. So this is what happens when we don't have standards uh, at play to help us. And of course, when we don't have standards at play, we have significantly higher uh, costs in the supply chain. So at its core, the GS1 system of standards is here to uh, to help industry to simplify, to automate, and to drive efficiencies into the supply chain. And how do they do that? So the GS1 standards make it possible to identify, capture, and share. And what do they identify? We we often talk about the three Ps. So when a company, let's let's say Nestle US, when Nestle US registers with GS1 in the US, they get assigned a a number. And that number is called a global prefix. And that prefix is actually like a license plate on your car. So it's a number that's assigned globally and uniquely to Nestle in the US. No other company in the world can actually have that number. And then once Nestle has that number, they can start identifying factories or distribution centra that they have in the US. So we call it party. The, the three Ps are party, which is the company Nestle. The uh, the premises, which is the locations, and the third one, uh, the third P is the products. So, and I'll go into that in a few in a few moments as well. So, think about the three P model: identify the the party, identify the premises, and identify the products. And then you have to capture that information, and and, and I'll talk about that in a few moments. And then, of course, the critical component is how do you share that information within a supply chain. Now, this is a massive slide and it's very busy, but I, I really want to uh, to simplify this for you. You see on the left-hand side where the circles are here, you have identify, capture, and share. As I mentioned, you, you can identify the premise. Now, the premise here, you have something called a GLN or global location number. And do you remember that number that I mentioned, the, the global company prefix? It's called a GCP that's assigned to Nestle in the U.S., Nestle can then assign a trailing digits to that global company prefix and come up with what's called a GLN. So it's always related. The first digits are the US, then there's the Nestle number, and then the GLN uh, specific number comes behind that. That whole number together is then called a GLN or global location number. Similarly, the first digits uh, in a product uh, are here you have on this slide, you have item. Uh, so let's call that product. Uh, on the product, you will have the same uh, leading digits, which will be Nestle US. And then they'll, the trailing digits behind that, uh, Nestle will have assigned to a particular product. And again, that product is globally and uniquely identified. Now, when I say that, if you have 24 bottles of water that are exactly the same and they're from Nestle in the US, they will have exactly the same GTIN or global trade item number. And that's because it's a product family code. And within the food industry or CPG industry, there's not a huge demand right now for serialization. It's coming. Believe me, it's coming. And second barcodes are, are going on to uh, products or data carriers are going on to products to try to uh, get down to that level of specificity. But the global trade item number is not a serialized number. It's a product family code that's assigned to a product. And it is globally and uniquely identifying the product. Now, I want to move this through this uh, a little bit briskly. But you then have a case where items, or let's say 24 items, go into a case. And then you have a serialized shipping container code on that, or you'll have another GTIN, which recognizes it as a box of 24 items. And then you have global returnable asset identifier. So let's say it could be a tote or it could be a pellet. That's the GRAI, which will have a unique identifier, the GTIN and the SSCC which would be on the pallet or on the container. And you see how that repeats itself going through the supply chain right over to the consumer, the patient, or the caregiver. So, And the GS1 system of standards enables the interoperability uh, through all of the uh, trading relationships in the supply chain. 
And one of the key things here to remember is that all of these companies will, will more than likely have different technologies and a different maturity of their technologies. But regardless, the GS1 system is the common language of business and allows them to share information. Now, if we pop down to capture, um, these are called barcodes here, but they're not actually barcodes. We prefer, or we used to prefer at GS1 to call them data carriers. So data carrier is the higher level name for all of these, which includes barcodes, QR codes, and, uh, and also RFID tags. So based on the information that a regulator will require, I'm, I call it the data to be carried on a, on a particular product, industry will then determine which data carrier can be used. So I hope that makes sense for you. And, and you can see here that GS1 also has a QR code, which is, uh, which is quite important. Um, anyway, I'll show you an example of uh, the data to be carried in just a few moments. And then how do you share that information? So the GS1 system helps to define master data, transactional data, and event data. And it also helps define which, which of that data is publishable or public. So think of, think of everything that's actually on a physical label. That's, that's information that's master data about a product. Generally speaking, master data does not change. It can change, but generally speaking, it does not change. And that's information that's on a product label or information about the brand owner. Let's, let's say Nestle again, and it's their address in the U.S., and it's the information about the product and its ingredients and so on and so forth. But there's information that is master data that's also private and it's not shared with the public. And that could be specific recipe or know-how, manufacturing processes and so on. And if you go into transactional data, this is information that's, uh, that, that happens during the production process. Think of a lot number or batch number that would be assigned to a product, but also transactional data that's created that's private could be the quality yields or in-house uh, uh, information that's gathered during the production cycles. And the event data then is information uh, where the products is shipping or moving from one location to another or from one party to another. So this is really the, the GS1 system. I know it's a, it's a bit of a busy slide, but if you get this, you can really, really accelerate your knowledge of how supply chains work. Moving on uh, very briskly onto this one. So the GS1 system allows the information to flow through the supply chain, and it helps to differentiate between data and information. And they are not interchangeable terms. Data is unprocessed raw data, and information is when it's parsed or filtered that to make logic. And I'll give you a very, very simple uh, example. If I, if I say to you, uh, if I give you a number, let's say 14165667611, it's just a string of numbers. But if I put a plus sign in front of it, then immediately it's going to turn from data into information and it becomes a plus one. And then you, you interpret that as, oh, this is a North, American, uh, a North American phone number. And of course the 416 means it's Toronto. And, and so on. So that's how you, trans, you can transform a very simple example of transforming data into information. But when you can do that through, through the supply chain, you can ensure accurate traceability and recall readiness, improve the shipment visibility, aid in the area of anti-counterfeit by, by uh, making sure that the data is flowing and the data related to the product. Uh, flows at the right time. Now, in anti-counterfeit here, we're not talking about GS1 providing anti-counterfeit tools, but GS1 provides the electronic tools and the physical labeling on the product where companies can then, based on the risk that they have within their supply chain, they can then layer security features on top of those uh, uh, products, uh, whether it's covert features built into a label or built into a package. And, uh, and, and things like that. The GS1 system of standards at its core also helps to implement regulation, and that's very, very important. And of course, it can enhance product safety by having better traceability and being able to recall the, the product. So moving on, this is an example of the CPG or food supply chain. I'll just show you a couple of examples. So right from the farm on the left-hand side, a global location number can be assigned to the farm. Uh, then the item number, the case, the palette, and it goes right through to the consumer as well. So think of this in context of even uh, blockchain and the origin trail protocol. This, this is what makes sense of all of the data. So if there's multiple trading partners here in the supply chain, this is where the origin trail protocol accelerates itself and accelerates the supply chain. 
by, by helping to streamline the data, get the data accurate, ensure that it's, uh, it's clean data, it's standardized, and then it flows from party to party. So the origin trail protocol is all based on this model here. Uh, and I think that's very important to, uh, to note. The healthcare supply chain, again, a little bit of a different uh, nuance here, but essentially the same model. Now, let me give you an example of healthcare and pharma uh, in the next slide here. This is from the European uh, Pharma Association. So regulators worldwide determined the data to be carried on a pharmaceutical product. And this is just an example here. But the data to be carried according to regulation is, if you look at the example here in the box, it says GTIN, the batch, the expiry, and the serial number. And then the industry, the pharma industry, and the healthcare industry will turn around to GS1 and say, okay, which of the data carriers or barcodes can actually carry that information? And the barcode that can carry that information is this one here. It's called a data matrix. And that's an example, if, if, the, if regulation says the product has to be uniquely identified, which is the case in food, then the simple linear barcode is sufficient. So that's, hopefully that gives you an example of regulation defining which data to be carried, and then industry defining which uh, data carrier can actually carry that data. So apparel and general merchandise is also a very, very similar model. Now, something that's different in the apparel and general merchandise, they're using RFID tags. Now, the RFID tags can go on to close. Let's say you walk into, uh, into uh, a shop in the U.S. or Canada or in Europe, and you want to buy a pair of jeans. There may be Your size may not be on the shelf. Well, typically, what the staff can do several times during the day, they can look, of course, at the uh, at the output of their cash registers and look at uh, in the inventory that needs to be replenished. Let's say they have uh, they want to keep two jeans that are size 32 waist and 32 leg on the shelf. If their cash register is not telling them that uh, that they're down one and to replenish to make sure that they have two on the shelf, they can also walk around with a barcode or with a, an, an RFID reader in their hand and just do a quick uh, scan. And that will capture all of the uh, clothes that they have within that general area. So these are projects that we started doing more than 10 years ago in, uh, in the US and in Europe. And it went uh, very, very quiet for a couple of years and now it's come back with a vengeance. So watch what's happening in the US, especially in apparel and general merchandise using the RFID tag. Again, think of use case here. This is not a regulatory requirement, but it's a, a, a perfect use case because it's very, very complex to go through a clothing store and know exactly what's on the shelf and which sizes are on the shelf. So the RFID tags is, is aiding that in the efficiency and the identification of the products that are, that are there. Transportation and logistics as well. Uh, this, this is well covered by, by GS1. So uh, we are talk about blockchain, we talk about moving physical containers around the world, and I just want to aggregate the data here and, and make a key point. We talk a, a lot and you will hear a lot about physical identification of a product. Let's call it a bottle of wine. But that's not what gets tracked in a supply chain, because what happens is that bottle of wine goes into a, a box and that box is a carton with 24 bottles of wine, and it has a separate number on the outside of it. And it's in most cases, it could be a serialized number. But then the 24 of those boxes go onto a pallet. And on the pallet, you have what's called here the SSCC, or the Serialized Shipping Container Code. So I want to stress this point. While a product is, on ship, is in shipment or in transit from party to party, it's the serialized shipping container code that gets tracked. And in a lot of cases, it's actually a level of aggregation higher. The global uh, shipment identification number or the GSIN, which is actually the, the, the eight or the 12 pallets that are actually inside a shipping container, the big metal shipping container. So think about that. This is very, very important for, for people that are not uh, too familiar with how you can aggregate and de-aggregate within the supply chain. The physical single product is not being tracked. I want to really stress that. That's really, really important. The SSCC is tracked at the pallet and the GSIN is being tracked. So when customs in many, many countries get uh, see a shipment coming in, they'll be looking for the SSCC. 
and that is a serialized uh, shipping container code used for many, many years and well recognized around the world. So that's a very, very important point. Look up to GS1 standards, talk to your local GS1 organization about how all of this fits together. And uh, they may actually have even modernized this since uh, my knowledge and information. So there may be, in fact, updates to, uh, to this. The technical industries as well, going down to components, uh, going into defense like chips. GS1 has covered that sector as well on behalf of the U.S. military. And uh, there are some risks that uh, products get into the electronic supply chain that are counterfeit. And they're working with industry and governments to try to uh, mitigate the risk of, uh, of fake products and drive improved traceability in that supply chain as well. So this is what I just talked about a few moments ago. The shipment gets tracked, the logistics unit gets tracked, the trade item gets tracked, the, the carton or the box, and the actual physical product as well. So if you understand this, this is crucially important, especially if you're a software company or if you're in a products company and didn't really realize how uh, your products moved through in a shipment. So what the Origin Trail team will be doing is they'll be looking at this level of aggregation when they're moving information from party to party. And this is, uh, again, I can't stress enough how important it is that, uh, that this hierarchy is understood uh, within a supply chain. So that's it. That's the quick summary. I've just gone over 21 minutes. I apologize for going a little bit longer than I expected. But the GS1 standards have significant value and benefits. They help to enable trust in the supply chain. They help to enable the interoperability between the trading partners. And in fact, they become the language of business. They enable the transparency of the data and the information and the visibility of the physical flow of the products. So with that, uh, if you're interested in getting involved, the Origin Trail protocol is the only the only protocol on, this, on the market today uh, that is able to physically do all of this stuff at a level of maturity and granularity that GS1 is likely very, very happy with. So get involved in the Trace Alliance. There's about, uh, I think, about 60 members of the Trace Alliance right now. Uh, here's the address. Register for the Trace Alliance. Become a member of this closed community where we're sharing information on how to do things better. And for those companies that uh, have done a, a project using the Origin Trail protocol, we have something exciting for you. We have an open call here. Look at the address and click on that. This is a program where there's up to $135,000 in rewards. There's also mentorship programs and also workshops with the, the hardcore technical gurus within the Origin Trail team that will help you to mature your project, expand your project, and hopefully drive rep replicability of your, your project and will help to promote it as well. So that's it for tonight. We're at uh, 23 minutes. Uh, again, a little bit longer than I wanted to do, but this is very, very important stuff and probably one of the most important um, briefings that you'll get related to the GS1 standards and how they integrate with Origin Trail. So thank you very much and uh, trace on. <laughs>